Hi, welcome everyone. My name is Charlotte DeCoster. I'm the Director of Education at the Dallas Holocaust and Human Rights Museum. Thank you for joining me today for our weekly series, Understanding the Holocaust, in which we delve into different topics related to Holocaust history to kind of get a better understanding of what that means. Uh, we also have a weekly series every Tuesday um, that uh, covers some glimpses into the museum in general, uh, but this is really more a series of diving into the general history of the Holocaust. Our topic for today will be deportation, and we're going to look at that uh, from a historical perspective. Um, I really encourage you, uh, once uh, the museum re reopens after our temporary closure, to go to the museum too and um, learn more about deportation from the perspective of the survivors. Uh, because today I'm going to really talk more about the historical facts and not really about the deportation experience, which I think is really uh, uniquely reserved for the survivors through their testimony to give that experience and not as much as uh, my role as a historian. So that's what we'll talk about a little bit today is those historical facts and, and the background uh, behind deportation. As this is a weekly series, I just wanted to give you a heads up as well that next week our um, museum archivist, uh, Felicia Williamson will be joining us for this series and she will be uh, explaining a little bit more about uh, the Kuchler album, which is an amazing artifact um, that we have in our archives and she will explain a little bit about that. So if you're interested in uh, Holocaust and uh, post-war um, uh, history, this would be a great um, event, to, virtual event to join as well. Um, as usual, this is a webinar, so if you have any questions, please don't hesitate to ask them. You can use the Q&A button, which should be at the bottom of your screen, uh, to uh, ask questions, and I'll see them come in uh, one by one. I do ask one favor that if you could please uh, make your questions as direct as possible and short as possible, it makes it easier for me to read them on this end um, and respond to you as we are going. Also, if you have any logistical problems at all, you're, uh, we also have two second co-hosts from our uh, programs department uh, join us as well on the webinar, and they can answer your logistical questions as well. Uh, so again, um, you can uh, leave questions as I'm going. You don't need to wait till the end. You can pose them in the Q&A, and I will try to weave them into our uh, discussion today. I'll also hold some time at the end to answer some of those broader questions as well. So uh, let's get started on our um, discussion on deportation during the Holocaust. First of all, um, as I am a museum uh, educator and I approach a lot from that perspective is it's really the first part I always explain uh, is that there are many concepts historically when it comes to deportation. And uh, for most visitors to our museum, especially adult visitors, it seems very uh, forward what the concept of deportation is. But we do have some adult visitors, many our students that have heard that word deportation in a very different con uh, concept uh, and are oftentimes confused between what deportation means during the Holocaust or deportation um, in other senses and, and the regular definition of uh, deportation. So I always start every historical lecture on deportation with these two simple definitions here. Because normally in society, and actually in a legal sense, um, deportation is defined as the removal of a person from a country, and that person is usually a, a foreigner, a non-resident alien, whose presence is unlawful there. Um, that is usually the concept of deportation, especially um, in a current sense, but throughout history, that is usually the removal of um, uh, a foreign person, uh, not a citizen of that country, um, from that um, from that country. Which, by the way, that type of deportation happens during the Holocaust too. Um, we, especially um, in the 1930s, we see that happening from Germany. Uh, and that applied to Jews as well. Now, uh, when it comes to genocide and when it comes to the Holocaust, that concept of deportation takes a much different notion, right? 
It is the forced removal of a group of people, of people, um, mostly uh, in the case of the Holocaust Jews, from their villages, towns, and cities to camps, to concentration camps or death camps. Um, and uh, so this is, this is not connected to the concept of citizenship because um, oftentimes there have laws that these people were at some point citizens of whatever country they were living in and were still being deported. But that citizenship had already legally usually been removed um, uh, by um, racial laws like the Nuremberg laws that had been implemented. And the deportation was really uh, not just the removal from that country, but the removal to a camp, uh, and in many sense to a death camp, and to you know the follow up for, from ex, uh, deportation is extermination. So uh, that is a big uh, difference uh, in a concept. And uh, think about it, right? When we have a students visit our museum, or if I'm a teacher and I'm in a classroom to younger students, and they know very little about the Holocaust. We have to historically start at this point. Um, and I also just want to say that to the general public, if you're talking maybe to your family and you have younger family members, um, make sure that when you start that conversation about deportation, um, that they have a clear understanding that during uh, the Holocaust, when we talk about this, that this is a forced removal of a group of people to camps. Um, um, uh, that are made and, and uh, several of these and many uh, Jews that are deported will be deported to the death camps. So I just want to start that, just make sure that we're all on the same page on that and that we are not today talking about the other form of deportation. So um, the deportation goes through many phases. Um, oftentimes when we think uh, historically about deportation, we think about the actual act of deportation to Jews being loaded onto train cars and then uh, deported to camps. Uh, but actually that process of deportation starts way, way, way before the actual act of uh, the Nazis and their collaborators uh, moving Jews onto these train cars. There's a whole process and system behind it. A lot of the deportation decisions, of course, were made on January 20th, 1942 at the Vanze Conference, where uh, the logistical sense uh, of the planning and the system of deportation was put in place. This doesn't mean that deportation didn't happen before 1942, but the really streamlining of deportation happens really at that point. And then we see an immense increase of deportation as well. But Jews in Germany had already been deported to the East uh, before we get to 1942. So that's important to remember as well. But once we get to the Wannsee Conference um, at, um, and the decisions that are made there on January 20th, 1942, the streamlining really happens. Uh, and throughout, we see these uh, deportation notices appear and they come in many different ways. Uh, in the East, uh, often uh, villages uh, in Poland and in other areas had these uh, public announcements uh, that a deportation was going to happen and was uh, calling on the Jewish po uh, population in that town to gather together and to come at a certain date uh, to uh, a collection point and Jews would be deported from there. And so you can see this, this first sign right here is a Bekentmachung, uh, is a warning, is a heads up saying, um, uh, the deportation will happen and these are some of the points uh, that you should appear and that you should follow. Like these are the rules for that. Uh, and you can see in, the, in, in this case in uh, two different languages in German on top. Uh, in the West, um, uh, certain ones of the smaller villages that might have small Jewish communities had these declarations, these Bekentmachungs as well. Um, and so here you can see an example from France, from this uh, town, Ville de champigny sur marine um, uh, for uh, the authorities asking for Jews to start reporting uh, for deportations. In the West, though, this often became problematic and Jews did not report for either registration or deportation. And um, new systems were put in place. So here we can actually see another uh, example of a deportation notice, and this is an individual deportation notice. 
where uh, each person was called up to report at a certain time and date uh, to be ready for deportation. And uh, this one is actually from uh, the Netherlands. A similar one was used in Belgium for Jews uh, to report. And you can see on there, uh, uprooping means a call up. Uh, and it will have the, the name of the person, the date that they need to report, the time and the items that they needed to bring for deportation. So this, uh, these bekendmachungs, these call-ups, these notices uh, were usually the first signs that deportations happened. Now, uh, in other cases, uh, roundups preceded notices or roundups happened at the same time. Uh, these are also often called razias, uh, where uh, uh, Nazis, Germans, the army, uh, and the, depending on what area in Europe, uh, sometimes uh, Ukrainians, Latvians, the local population, the local police would come in, close off a Jewish neighborhood, and basically round up everybody and walk them through to uh, the train station. Uh, so there was different forms of how the deportation was enacted. And so I wanted to show uh, some of these uh, deportation notices that are come out because oftentimes people are not aware that these letters were sent out or that these posters were made av available and that alerts were given out. This is a little notice though. When those alerts went out, it did give some Jews the opportunity to go in hiding. A very famous case is, of course, the Frank family. When Margot Frank receives her deportation notice, it is the alert for Otto Frank, the father, to move his family into hiding. And so the same day that Margot receives her call-up notice, her deportation notice, is the day that the Frank family goes into hiding. And she received, actually, you can find it online if you uh, search Margot um, Frank deportation notice, you will find a, exactly the same kind of uprooping uh, call up letter, but her name on it, the time and date that she needs to report and the list of things that she needed to bring. And think about it, right? Margot was the only one in the family that got that deportation notice on that day not the rest of the family, which means this young girl, this teenager, would have been deported without her family because they were not called up. So not necessarily people, whole families receive these deportation notices at the same time. Uh, so uh, this, I wanted to start with that, to give that introduction to the action of starting the deportation. It comes with these notices, these calls up, or uh, these roundups. And talking a little bit more about these roundups, um, when notices weren't going out and, and these big roundups happening, they were often very public, where people could see it. The whole city, the whole town, the village, we, we literally would see their neighbors being rounded up, pulled out of their houses, and marched towards train stations. Because not necessarily was the neighborhood or the area where uh, most Jews were living in that town or village is close to the train station. So we have endless of these pictures of Jews being rounded up in all kinds of different areas of Europe and being marched to these train stations. So um, this was, uh, you know, very public events. So people across Europe knew what these deportations were all about. They witnessed them happening. And uh, they knew that, you know, being deported to the East, especially if you were in the West, was not a good thing. The, being deported from your village was not a good thing. And they knew that this persecution was happening. Uh, and just to give you some ideas, um, this, uh, image on the top here is uh, Jews being deported uh, in, uh, I think, I believe this is from 1942 uh, here in from Germany. So this is happening in Germany. You can see the law enforcement officers are standing there, but there's some other people walking by and just uh, what you can't see, it's kind of cropped out, but there's actually a lady looking out of the, out of the window. Uh, this is an image from my home country of Belgium, from Brussels, where you can clearly see them, you know, lined up, being marched out, and then very publicly in the middle of Brussels being walked out to the train station 
uh, away again another image from Germany uh, here are some images from Poland as well uh, showing this very public and, and people look right there's windows people can see this everywhere uh, some people would just come out and kind of watch this uh, and, and, and look upon uh, as the Jews were being deported so that was in a sense is that that march to uh, the train station is in a sense the after the call of the second phase of deportation and uh, one of our um, uh, participants today asked what were the German what was the Germans rationale for calling up only one member of the family so in the case uh, of the Netherlands, uh, for a while, they were going by age list in different groups, and uh, they didn't necessarily go by family. For a while, they were calling up men of a certain age, then they were calling women up of a certain age, and they were going by target and gender groups, which resulted in Margot Frank being called up first uh, uh, and, uh, and the rest of the family being called up later. Uh, in other countries, they did the whole towns and they did the whole village uh, at the same time, and it was more in this roundup matter, and they just did a public announcement, and then the roundup happened. Uh, in, in Belgium, they went more targeted by family, so a lot of times it was the local organization that decided how this deportation happened. Uh, including in the ghettos, um, in the ghettos, the decision of who would be deported often felt on the, fell on the Judenrate, and they had to make the decision, and a tremendously difficult decision, right, of who would be deported and who would not be reported. And so we can see some distinctions between what Judenrates, what distinctions uh, of decisions that they make. For example, in Warsaw, uh, there were regular lists being made up by the Judenrate, and they tried to keep families together, um, uh, and, and, and really in groups and sections of the ghetto go one by one. In Lodge, the philosophy was to uh, deport the weaker first so that the stronger could keep working for and prove uh, their use to the Nazis so that they not would all be murdered out and that some potentially could survive. As a result, the elderly and the children were deported first, and um, there's some dramatic scenes from uh, a Lodge uh, where uh, parents are saying through the fence goodbye to their children before they're being deported. So different Yudorada approach different uh, philosophies of how these deportations had to happen, but uh, on each of these, these, these were horrendous decisions to make um, for uh, those Jewish councils. So I first wanted to talk, you know, I talked a little bit about um, in the ghettos, how uh, those deportations were set up. Uh, in the West, the, the Jewish councils, the Jews were not forced into ghettos and the Jewish councils really uh, were, had to work with uh, the Nazis to basically get the whole country to collect it together and the Jews then in one central area to deport to the East. The Germans wanted to give the facade that, you know, the Jews were going to go just work in the East. They weren't necessarily being murdered there. They just were going to uh, um, uh, go work in labor camps in the East somewhere else. This was not to agitate the local population, the Aryan local population in Western European countries. So the Germans established uh, deportation camps here, and there was three deportation camps established near the major centers of uh, where uh, uh, Jews lived. So uh, the first, one of the first ones that was established was uh, in the Netherlands, uh, was Westerbork uh, deportation camp. It served the popu Jewish population from Amsterdam and Den Haag and a little bit from Rotterdam and collected those Jews together and brought them closer to the German border in the north to a camp there in a small village of Westerbork. And they bu actually built a camp there. You can see this is the, the camp uh, site, uh, very rural and uh, the barracks being built here. And Jews were collected in this camp and from here sent to the death camps. Uh, so that's how these deportation camps served. They were basically anti-chambers to the, de to the death camps. 
they were holding pins and once uh, enough trains uh, once enough train cars could be filled the Jews would be loaded on those train cars they would be sent uh, to one of the death camps and then they would fill up the, the, the camp again until enough train cars could be filled and then the next one went off and that's basically their pre-holding pins for deportations that's what these deportation camps came to be the second one was the camp in Belgium uh, in the city of Mechelen, which is right in the middle between Brussels and Antwerp which were the largest centers of Jewish population in Belgium so the Jews were rounded up in Antwerp or in Brussels or received deportation notices to report in those cities and then they were marched to the train station brought to Mechelen were held here until they could fill up enough train cars and then uh, most of these trains went to Auschwitz and then finally um, uh, near for France, uh, the largest uh, uh, center of Jewish population was in Paris. So Drancy is a suburb out of Paris. You can actually take a very easy metro line still today, take the metro uh, out to Drancy. Uh, at that point, it was still a small village. Now it's quite a big uh, suburb town. And um, there, um, so Jews from France were deported uh, from John C. But also they established many other concentration camps in uh, France and in southern France, in Vichy France. So a lot of times from those camps, Jews were funneled into John C. and then deported to the death camps, including Auschwitz and Sobibor. Uh, what I also put on my slide is the number of transports. And you, you can see, you know, um, the uh, drastic deportations out of Westerbork, 103 transport. Uh, 97,776 deportees on those trains, uh, 28 from uh, Belgium from the Mechle deportation camp uh, with about tw over 25,000 deportees, 64 from Drancy with over 64,000 deportees. The survival rate once you left these deportation camp was immensely low. Uh, for Belgium, uh, less than 4% that was deported would survive. Uh, and that is, you know, very drastic. So ending up in a deportation camp was, uh, was, you know, like I said, it was the anti-chamber to these death camps because uh, your survival rate was very low uh, once you were in it. So resistance against this did happen. Uh, people received their notices, uh, like I said, to you know, appear at these deportation camps and these collection points, and they just would not show up. They would go into hiding. Uh, this was much more feasible uh, in Belgium and France, uh, and much harder, of course, in the Netherlands uh, that had a fully ingrained uh, Nazi government in place, whereas France and Belgium had a military government in place, uh, which actually made it a little bit more flexible. Also in France, you could escape south uh, up until 1943 and tried to make it into Vichy uh, because deportations did not happen under Vichy only when Vichy was uh, the Vichy the southern French portion um, was occupied by the Germans then deportations started from there so uh, so this is how the west in a sense got deported to the east but this is happening um, as far as we can see, if we could look at the map of Europe, these deportations pop up one after the other, country after country that is occupied, that falls under German occupation, uh, will be uh, part of this deportation process. So Greece, Norway, Denmark, although Denmark has this big famous res rescue, but that happens this rescue happens because the deportations were going to start. Uh, so every single country one by one falls under uh, this process of deportation. So what the rest of the talk I wanted to talk about was about the, the modes of transportation to that and how the actual deportation process worked. Now, uh, deportation, uh, since it ha happened from, you know, as far south as Greece, as far north as Norway, 
uh, West France, East Russia, uh, pretty much all over Europe was mainly done by train car. Uh, most of the death camp, uh, all of the death camps were located on existing rail lines and this existing rail line structure was used to deport the Jews to the main six death camps or to other concentration camps. Uh, so it wasn't that new, uh, massive new train lines were being installed. A lot of times the camps were already near these existing train lines, including the deportation camps. A lot of the deportation camps were on these existing lines as well. So, um, so after the roundup, the Jews were taken to deportation camps or the train stations from where they would be deported and were then loaded on the train cars. Uh, interesting enough, there is a little bit of logistics behind this as well. All of these train cars uh, had to come from different areas. So in Belgium, for example, uh, the Germans used uh, train cars available in Belgium and oftentimes asked assistance from the Belgian railroad services same in France and in other areas, and then including the German Reichsbahn, the German railways also took care of this. There had to be people driving the trains and, and guarding the trains and all this different logistical that came by it, and this needed to be provided for. So interesting enough, the Jews were required to pay their own tickets onto their deportation train. This money was usually taxed from uh, the Jewish Council or the Judenrate, and then paid to the German Reichsbahn so that the Ge German Reichsbahn could book uh, these train cars and could then officially have them on the books, have them paid for, and schedule them. So think about the logistics that this takes, right? Taxation of the Jewish population to get the tickets. Uh, uh, then once the money was in, the German Reichsbahn would schedule the, you know, the um, German railways, the railway systems would schedule this. They actually had travel agents working to book all of these trains. That's the madness of this logistical plan, uh, uh, system behind this. Uh, and then the trains would roll up when um, the tickets were fulfilled and, and you know, enough Jews were rounded up. And uh, the SS would help then with the guarding and protecting. Sometimes the German army would be called in, but mainly uh, this fell on SS guards to uh, guard the train or local collaborators. Uh, and so uh, as trains were being booked, uh, in the beginning, uh, what we see is when deportation happened, mostly passenger trains were booked. So the first really when we see uh, 40, 1940, 1941, 1942, the main mode of deportation, the main train car being used are third class passenger trains. And that's something that most people don't know because when you visit museums or you read about deportation, you often hear cattle cars or you hear box cars. Rarely do you hear about third class passenger trains. But as you can see from all of these images here, um, these are all images of deportations from different countries, right? You can see on the top from Bielefeld uh, in 1941, uh, Jews being deported, and that is actually what that part of that second set of images. And you can clearly see these are third class passenger trains. You can see the windows and the doors. You can even see the little numbers. Some of them even have little curtains on it. Um, so these third class passenger trains were used. Of course, they were overstuffed, over capacity, right? This is not what normally the capacity would be for a third class passenger train. And, and there was no provisions in there, still immensely horrible conditions. Plus, uh, the victims on these trains had oftentimes no idea where exactly that they were going in the East or were being told something that was totally not true. So the anxiety that came with that as well. Um, uh, uh, here you can see uh, as well from the Lodge Ghetto uh, when deportation started to, in this case, to Helmo, uh, that uh, it, even from the ghettos that their class passenger trains were used in Poland. And a lot of times they were Polish uh, uh, passenger trains, German passengers trains. Uh, here you can see it from the Plunsk Ghetto in Poland as well. You can see the poor little, little ones, you know, the children and uh, being loaded up and everybody 
uh, still gathering their belongings. In this case, you can see uh, Jews in the German pictures, you can see Jews are still allowed to take their belongings with them. Uh, in the Plunk's ghetto one, you can see on the images, uh, the uh, belongings have already been taken away from them. Uh, a lot of times they were kept on that location and then were, were separate sent into Germany. And then even here, this is an image from a deportation from Trace, uh, from near Greece, from the Macedonia area. Uh, and in 1943, as late as in 1943, and you can see the passenger car train being used. Uh, and, and these deportations lasted sometimes days, right? Because that is a long ride all the way going north, uh, going to Auschwitz, in this case, going to Auschwitz. So, uh, uh, so the first train cars to be booked for these deportations are passenger trains. Um, they're frequently used, they're jam-packed, uh, but there are uh, things that happen when you use a passenger train. First of all, People can look out of the window to see where they're going, and two, people can look into the windows. Uh, and it became much more public. So again, the first deportations that started happening even into 1943 were very public, something that most people are not aware of. We think again that this happens all behind the scenes and that people are not aware, uh, but that is not. You can clearly see from this image just how how out there this is. And then these train cars would start moving on train tracks, often going through cities, through villages, and people could see in the windows. Uh, you can see in some of these cases, the windows could be opened. Uh, and that to the Germans kind of became a risk. Also, if you can open the window, even if the doors are locked, you could jump out. And this started happening. Uh, we have several documentations of Jews starting to jump out of trains from uh, the deportation camp from Mechle to Auschwitz to the point that the uh, uh, people in charge of the deportation between Belgium and Auschwitz decided we cannot use passenger trains anymore because it is too easy for Jews who want to ju jump off to jump off from these trains and we need to keep this illusion that they're going to uh, this happy place where they can work in the East and that it's better off for them. We don't want to create this panic. We want to keep this illusion uh, that the Nazis are setting, that there is something better there, that uh, they can't survive there. And, um, and we don't want to have this trigger effect happening. And we also don't want um, all these towns to see and what is happening either. And just boarding up these windows uh, is not enough. So starting, uh, 42, 43, we see more often switching instead of this booking of passenger trains, a shift to boxcars, which I'll talk about in just a second. And um, uh, the second reason that this happens besides just the visibility and the risk of Jews escaping is also uh, that uh, uh, due to war, uh, passenger cars are more needed for the public, uh, not for deportations, and that these could be used for other services, not necessarily uh, for moving Jews, and that there is other modes. And that combination uh, really restarts more seeing the use of boxcars. Uh, and so really, 1942, 1943, 1944, uh, the mass deportations that will happen will be through the use of boxcars. Uh, now, boxcars are, uh, are used for uh, non-alive cargo, essentially. Uh, not for alive cargo, not for cattle, not for other animals. Uh, boxcars are mainly used for uh, raw material, um, different from grain to other things. Uh, basically, that is the concept of a boxcar. Most people don't understand that. In, in uh, that, uh, you know, different train cars are used for different purposes, and and so the boxcars, in a sense, are are not meant for uh, human cargo. But during wartime, boxcars are often used. Uh, they are easy ways uh, to move uh, troops. Uh, rather than having them march from one area to another area. 
So we see the use of boxcars during World War I, but also during World War II, German troops, Soviet troops, different uh, countries will move their armies uh, by boxcar. But it's very different from deportation of the Jews. When you move your troops or other groups of population, you leave the doors open. You put just like you wouldn't overstuff a passenger train, you would not overstuff that boxcar. You would put maybe 20, 30 troops, uh, soldiers in there, and then the next boxcar, you could give them their space so they can lay down, have the door open, they would have water, they would have food. Um, that is not the case when it comes to the deportation of the Jews. Jews would be overpacked in these boxcars. Uh, depending on the size from 100 to over 150 something cramped in there with barely space to breed. Uh, and you can see some of these scenes right here and you can see these are all uh, different types of, of boxcars. This one uh, on the right here where the little baby is is from Westerborg deportation camp, uh, the train car. Um, um, uh, some from Poland here, and then this is one of the last group of Jews to be deported from Hungary. Uh, Hungary was an ally of Germany for a long time, but once Germany occupied Hungary, they started the deportation of the Jews. So this is a scene from 1944, from the spring, summer of 1944, where Jews are arriving in boxcars from Hungary. Uh, at Auschwitz, and you can see just the cramped nature and, and the chaos that comes with this of uh, loading up and the, the conditions in there. Uh, so, um, so the second way of deportation was uh, uh, boxcars, and that's kind of that middle period. Most of the survivors, when they talk about deportation and testimonies in different ways, when they talk about being crowded up and crammed up and having almost no space to breathe and, and, and being jam-packed in and they can't see anything because they're closed up because you can see there's no windows. There's hardly any ventilation because this, again, this is not for cargo that's supposed to be alive. Um, uh, this is for cargo that does not need ventilation in a sense. Uh, so there's very uh, little uh, ventilation in here and a lot of times it was even blocked off. Uh, so um, uh, this deportation, uh, these, uh, so when survivors talk about that, they talk about being confined in and not being able to see anything. That usually means that they were being deported in a boxcar. And that's most of the testimonies that you will get is survivors who were deported in boxcars. When you hear, uh, listen to it, um, you'll hear when they talk about that confined space, it's that boxcar. Uh, it's them be talking about being deported in a boxcar. The reason that most survivors talk about boxcars and talk about this space is, and not as much the earlier phase, is Jews who were deported in that earlier phase with train cars, the survival rate was much lower because they were the early group of Jews to arrive at the death camps or at the camps. And when you arrived in 41, early 42, your survival rate was much lower. So we have much less survivors who can testify actually being on those third class passenger trains. We have a largest percentage of survivors that survived the boxcar deportations and then the death camps or the concentration camps afterwards. Uh, so that's why we have more testimonies uh, from survivors talking about deportations in the uh, boxcars. Then our third form of uh, mode of deportation that was booked um, uh, by the Nazis is cattle cars. Towards the end of the war, um, boxcars needed to be used to move troops, especially fleeing the Soviet Union. Um, more boxcars were needed. The Germany and uh, different areas of German occupied Europe were being bombed by the Allies and boxcars were being destroyed, especially uh, the US military often targeted and the British military as well, the air forces uh, targeted um, train stations, uh, railroad areas. And with that, a lot of boxcars were destroyed. Uh, so the Germans started to slowly use cattle cars 
um, they had already used this for Soviet POWs in the East uh, to put them on these long train car rides until, you know, they would uh, suffer from exhaustion and the climate that impacted them. Because as you can see, cattle cars are mainly open top. Sometimes they are closed, but then it's like a grid around it and it's kind of semi open on top. But mainly these cattle cars, as you can see, are fully open on top. And actually what you can see here, the picture on the, on the right, uh, right top is actually a photo of these Soviet POWs being deported. We have very few pictures of deportations of Jews in cattle cars because they usually happened much later to the war, into the war uh, and later into the Holocaust, so 44, 45, when boxcars started getting really scarce. Uh, a lot of times survivors will testify of being in a cattle car in connection to the death marches. So again, late 44, 45, uh, is oftentimes when these cattle cars are being used. And uh, they, again, they're open on top, so you're uh, exposed to the elements, right? The snow, freezing, rain, cold, harsh sun in the summer. Uh, but as they were mainly used during the winter of 44, 45, a lot of survivors will testify to the harsh coldness, especially if you've already been on a death march and then you go on one of these and, and, and people literally freezing, um, um, in um, these cattle cars. So I just wanted to share uh, a little Im some images with you as well so you could see that distinction between those different modes of deportation. Um, I always like to give the example of Elie Wiesel. Uh, in his book Night, uh, he talks about um, different modes of deportation. When uh, Elie Wiesel, and if you've not read the story, he is first deported from the Hungarian-Romanian border from his town of Siget uh, to Auschwitz. When he is deported uh, in that phase, he is in a boxcar and he talks about this confinement, not being able to see out, not being realizing where they are going. But when he is deported from Auschwitz during the death marches into Germany to other uh, concentration camps, and in his case, Buchenwald, uh, he is in a cattle car. He talks about being fully exposed and uh, trying to stay awake. Him and the spotter are trying to keep each other awake because it is so cold. It is, you know, the wind and, and the freezing and everything um, and, and the conditions are horrendous. So if you want to uh, get uh, uh, information about survivors talking about what it was like to be in these boxcars, you can read several memoirs. Uh, including Elie Wiesel, Kiel Rachman's work um, on The Last Jew of Treblinka, Gerda Weizmann Klein. There's several ones that talk about the conditions. Again, other ways you can learn about it is uh, to go to um, uh, listen to testimonies. For example, by the USC Shoah Foundation. It has a very great educational website called Eyewitness where you can listen to some of them. You uh, can come to our museum and uh, see our film. We have a film curated actually in our boxcar where our survivors uh, talk about uh, the experience being in the boxcar. So uh, I encourage you besides just learning about these different modes is to listen to the actual descriptions by the survivors and then also understand that um, they might be different in their descriptions because they might be on different train cars and that really impacted uh, the way they talked about their deportation as well. So this, why, this is also why we have this um, odd phenomena that although survivors might know that they're on a boxcar versus a cattle car, that they still say that they're being deported on a cattle car. Um, and that is usually a psychological effect by the feeling that they have of this being herded, being treated like animals, being dehumanized, that they frequently call boxcars cattle cars, although that they are technically not cattle cars. Uh, they are technically boxcars. Uh, so that is a very um, a psychological um, phenomena that is uh, slowly more and more being studied within the broader spectrum of Holocaust studies is the impact of the treatment connected to these 
uh, modes of transportation is how the survivors view their experience as well and how they give testimony to it. Um, uh, one of our participants just asked um, uh, earlier on, were the Jews who were not citizens of a particular country, France, uh, first to be deported? Yes, that is actually right. Uh, it, usually the first groups uh, of Jews to be deported were refugees in a certain country. So for example, German Jews or Polish Jews who had fled from Poland or from Germany to other countries like say, for example, France and did not have citizenship in France, usually those were the ones to be deported first. And that was because the Jewish councils of those countries were protect, trying in a sense to protect Jews that had citizenship and hope, hoping to protect them from deportations and they would offer foreign Jews first. So uh, for deportation. So that frequently happened that if you did not have earlier citizenship in that country, uh, that you were selected to be deported first. So uh, we call this the national versus foreign syndrome of deportation. So great question, Ellen. Thank you for that. So a little, I did, although this series is technically not about the museum, this is about just understanding Holocaust history in general. Um, you know, our museum is a history museum, so I do want to talk a little bit about the history behind our boxcar at the museum because it is very unique and it's, as I put here on my slide, it's the first of its kind. Um, our survivor community and our community as a whole um, uh, led uh, by uh, one of our survivors, Mike Jacobs, uh, um, was able to get uh, a boxcar donated from uh, the Belgian government. Uh, that was a type of boxcar that was used during the Holocaust uh, to be donated to what was back then the Dallas um, Holocaust Memorial Center, which was located uh, at the Jewish Community Center uh, on the uh, lower level floor. And so when the museum first opened, uh, it had a boxcar, which was really unique because no other museum had that at that point. And it was really kind of the driving force of our community um, that um, brought that boxcar in and made that its key artifact uh, so that people could understand the impact of deportation and understand the size of these boxcars and what it meant to be in there. And so the picture on the in, on the top left that you can see there is an image of Mike Jacobs standing in our boxcar when it was still located uh, um, on North Haven Road at the, by the Jewish Community Center. Uh, and so this has always been a key artifact. It's been a key piece of it. And as you might know, many museums have followed that trend uh, where you can go to the museum and see one of these boxcars. Uh, uniquely, when the Belgian government donated that boxcar to the museum, um, it was an authentic boxcar from that time period. Uh, we have since then our archival team, led by Felicia Williamson, our museum archivist, uh, has been able uh, to dig up archival material from the Belgium archives, uh, actually the Belgium Railroad archives, that uh, this boxcar was originally a reparation payment from the German government to Belgium as a reparation payment for World War I for the damages that Germany caused in Belgium. Once the Germans, uh, so this boxcar was made in Germany, then brought to Belgium, it was used by the Belgian Railroad. Once it was then used um, when the Germans invaded, of course it was a German boxcar, so they basically just reclaimed this boxcar and it went back in a sense onto the German, into the German railroad system. Um, and, and we know it was used during that time period. Uh, then when Belgium was liberated, the boxcar went bel back to the Belgium railroads and was used again. So, um, so uh, for, uh, uh, for cargo again. Uh, and that's uh, uh, by the time uh, when it was in the 80s donated to the museum, it was ready to be scrapped for metal. And that's how it came to the museum. Uh, it was shipped in through Houston, came to Dallas, and uh, went into the Jewish Community Center. Then when the museum moved in 2005 uh, to be the Dallas Holocaust Museum in downtown Dallas, it moved with us. And you can see uh, it was always kind of re re uh, re 
proportion parts of it went into storage to fit into the building. So when we opened the new museum, uh, it was historically professionally restored by conservators, uh, train car conservators. I didn't even know that that existed, but yes, that's a whole field of conservation right there um, to restore, uh, restore historical train cars. Uh, our train car um, was uh, basically fully restored to its piece. So now when you visit our museum, you can see it sitting there. You can fully experience that boxcar and walk through it and see it uh, the, the way it was meant to be as um, uh, an artifact. Uh, and this is really unique. As I said, right, it's kind of a, a pride for us to have as a museum that we were the first one to realize the importance and have that always be part of our museum. So I just wanted to end uh, with that. And um, I'll take some of your questions. Uh, if anybody has any questions, I can take them now. And you're, again, you're welcome to put questions in the Q&A. There's a Q&A button on the bottom. Just while I'm waiting uh, to see if there's any questions, I just wanted to let you know that again next week, uh, our Understanding the Holocaust uh, series will focus on um, artifact interaction related to Holocaust history. We will be looking at the Kuchler album, uh, which uh, I'll let uh, our museum archivist talk more about it, but it is a very unique artifact related to the Holocaust from uh, the post-war era. Uh, but we have a whole other series of events as well um, for uh, more fam family-friendly programs, uh, such as tomorrow our um, uh, I Read Book Club is our family-friendly book club at 1 p.m. We are reading The Devil's Arithmetic uh, for that book club. And if you've not read it, you can still read it. It's a short book. You can get it on most Kindles and iBooks. Um, and uh, the very cool thing is for our I Read Book Club tomorrow, for the family friendly one, the author, Jane Yolen, who is an amazing author, she's written over 300 books, will be joining us. We also have a book club for adults on Monday, and that author uh, from the Lila Girls is gonna join us as well. So uh, another really unique event in this virtual time that you can join as well uh, for that. So look up all of our, our uh, virtual programs as well. There's so much something unique for everybody to join. And I have some questions coming in. Was getting up and down into the boxcar a big problem with the old disabled? Um, yes, it was. Uh, they weren't shot, they weren't executed a lot of times, but they off frequently would die in boxcars during that process uh, from um, uh, mainly uh, deprivation of oxygen a lot of times. When you mentioned travel agency for deportations, were they in? in on the lie or did they think they were sending deportees to a better life? Uh, they usually understood what they were working on and where those people were going that they were being sent. They were booking um, uh, uh, tickets to Auschwitz-Birkenau and they understood what was happening at Auschwitz-Birkenau. So they knew what they were doing. Yes. Uh, so if it was, uh, so if our boxcar was reclaimed in World War II and used for deportations and then reinstated in Belgium for use, do you think it had uh, unpleasant meaning for many people seeing it in use for its original purpose. Um, I don't think probably, uh, it's hard to identify which exact boxcars, just by the eye, right, which are used. There are so many, uh, if you visited Europe, especially Belgium, there are so many boxcars uh, on the roads that it's hard to distinguish between them. Um, so it is such a common feature growing up myself in Belgium of seeing them zooming by. Now these days they're not wood, they're metal. Uh, but um, that um, uh, I don't think for the regular population it was an issue. I can imagine that for survivors it must be really hard. But many of the survivors did not stay in Europe for not just this reason, but many other reasons as well. So, um, so and in, 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 um, in, the, in the United States, it's train use is much more distance. It's much more removed from us. It's not as in your face as it is in Europe. So um, that might be a great question to ask a survivor if you get the chance to ever meet a survivor. 
Okay, thank you for joining me today. Thank you for your amazing questions. Um, please join us for our other virtual programs or join us next week for this really cool artifact interaction. I hope to see you again. Have a great day. Bye.